thank you everybody for coming today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Frank Marlowe. I have the pleasure of serving as Dean of Academics here at IWP. For those of you who haven't been here before, let me welcome you to IWP. Uh, we're very glad to have you come out today on such a beautiful day uh, to, to listen to what I think is going to be a really, really great talk. I'd like to welcome you to the first, the inaugural lecture in the China in the 21st Century uh, lecture series that we've created. We're co-sponsoring it with a couple of, of great organizations. The first is uh, the National Bureau of Asian Research, which we have uh, uh, Roy Kampausen here to represent, as well as uh, our distinguished speaker himself. Uh, and so we're very happy to, to be able to do that. This is also being sponsored by the Movement for the Renaissance of Vietnam, which is an organization uh, led by one of the board members of the Board of the Trustees here at IWP, uh, who unfortunately cannot be here today, but uh, I want to acknowledge that as well. This event is being held under uh, the Chatham House rule, which means that attendees may use the information in this lecture but may not reveal the identity or the affiliation of anyone who participates. We ask that you uh, respect that. Okay, uh, let me uh, now introduce our speaker, uh, Ms. Nadej Roland. She is the Senior Fellow for Political and Security Affairs at the National Bureau of Asian Research based in Seattle and Washington, D.C. Her research focuses mainly on China's foreign and defense policy and the changes in the regional dynamic caused by the rise of China. Drawing on her over 20 years <coughs> of experience in the French government, she also examines the prospects of transatlantic cooperation uh, in research and policy related to Asia. Uh, she's the author of China's Eurasian Century, Political and Strategic Implications of the Belt and Road, Road Initiative, which was published in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, please let me, uh, please help me welcome Madhya Jirvan. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to adjust the height of the... <laughs> thank you very much for your very warm welcome and thank you all for being here today. It is my great pleasure and honor to uh, inaugurate this speaker series. Um, thank you for the sponsors. Um, the presentation I'm going to make today is based on an article I just published with the Royal Society for Asian Affairs that's based in London. Um, and built on the work I've done with NBR for the past five years on the development of Chinese foreign policy under Xi Jinping, which includes at its core uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And I think that it's very fitting when looking at China in the world in the 21st century, in the century ahead, to examine what Xi Jinping himself called the project of the century, which is now globally known as the Belt and Road Initiative or BLI. And the second Belt and Road Forum was convened in Beijing just two weeks ago, so I think it's just a good time to pause and, and examine what is going on, uh, what has been achieved, and how the initiative has evolved and is going to continue to evolve in the, in the short term. So I, I'm going to focus on three main points. First, um, maybe introduce uh, what Belt and Road is, its stated goals and its, uh, its intentions, or Beijing's intentions. Um, second, I will examine a little bit of the pushback that the initiative has encountered over the last um, 18 months or so. And then I'm going to turn into how Beijing is trying to address this pushback and react and, and adapting to, to it. So first, um, very briefly, because I think most of you must be um, familiar uh, with Belt and Road, but it was launched in 2013. Um, it was originally composed of uh, the continental Silk Road Economic Belt and the 21st century maritime Silk Road going through uh, the Indian Ocean. It was originally very focused on the Eurasian continent itself and its surrounding waters with the main idea of connecting uh, the region to China via uh, the building of uh, infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, ports, railways, but also energy infrastructure like pipelines, hydro power dams and power grids, and also um, internet um, information technology infrastructure like fiber optic networks and, and data centers, etc. The Eurasian core has expanded now to uh, Latin America, to Africa, to the South Pacific as well, 
and has expanded from the Indian Ocean to the Arctic and the South Pacific Oceans. There's also a Silk Road in the cyberspace and in space. It's called the Digital Silk Road. So it's very, it has become a very comprehensive and almost global endeavor. What is often, often overlooked is that Belt and Road is not just about infrastructure building. Uh, in fact, infrastructure building is just one of five connectivities or five links uh, that compose the Belt and Road and that Beijing has proposed. Uh, the first is policy cooperation. The second is infrastructure building. The third is unimpeded trade. The fourth is financial integration. And the last one is people-to-people -people exchanges. So you see there's several components to it. And taken together, those five connectivities or the five components are supposed to bring about what Beijing calls a community of common destiny or a community of shared future, depending on how you want to translate it. What this means really um, is that Belt and Road's ultimate objective is to create a regional integration under uh, China's helm. Um, the objective is really to pull the broader region closer to China's orbit and eventually creating a Sinocentric order. This reflects Beijing's worldview and is also an instrument to support an alternative organization of the world that is very much unlike the current liberal order which Beijing considers as being US-led or Western-led, um, unfair and obsolete. In the process of promoting uh, BRI, Beijing is not only redrawing the geography of the region, BRI is expanding along six economic corridors and three economic, uh, blue economic passages that radiate outwards from China like spokes around the China hub. It is also reshaping the discourse, the standards and the norms that underpin this vision for a Sinocentric order. And I think that BRI's intangible dimensions are as important, if not more impactful in the long run, than its actual concrete manifestations as railroads and ports. Lastly, BRI has been enshrined in the Chinese constitution in 2017. It carries Xi Jinping's uh, personal seal and it's intimately tied to his legacy. It's really here to stay. The leadership has designed it for a specific purpose. It has devoted uh, massive human and economic resources and also political capital to make it succeed. But this does not necessarily mean that everything will, will go as Beijing wants. And that's my second point, which is the pushback that Belt and Road has encountered over the last two years, both domestically and internationally. Really already in the early months after the launch of Belt and Road, a few Chinese intellectuals offered words of caution. Some called for strategic prudence. Um, Belt and Road might be opening too many battlefields and overstretch Chinese capabilis uh, capabilities. Others cautioned about BRI's projects becoming white elephants, wasteful. And others talked about the financial risks associated with lending money to newly emerged countries. And more recently, last year, as Xi Jinping was about to begin a series of uh, uh, visits to Africa, a retired university professor published a short blog entry criticizing the leadership for throwing money around, um, while China remained a country where the poor still struggle for school, healthcare, and support for their elders. A um, week after the publication of his post, he was arrested at his apartment while he was conducting an interview with the Voice of America. <clears throat> a similar critique came from Tsinghua Professor in a lengthy essay that was published online and that warned the leadership of a, on a wide array of topics, including a critic of the uh, government's excessive international aid. And because of domestic censorship and control of public opinion, the level of resistance within China is quite difficult to assess. There's an evidence, at least, that a certain degree of disapproval um, is going on among public intellectuals. 
But most importantly, or equally importantly, there's been a mounting wave of criticism uh, emanating from outside of China over the last also 18 to two, 18 months to two years. And that, but that criticism or uh, can actually be dated back to the early days of PRI. Uh, back then, it was still called the One Belt One Road or Obor. And uh, most of the external commentators were dismissive of it and rejected it as ill-defined or too ambitious. And most of the Western commentary, at least, um, was very skeptical of China's capacity to afford the cost, especially in the light of China's own economic slowdown. And starting in late 2017, there are several prominent officials who publicly expressed concerns about the Belt and Road geopolitical intentions. Uh, so, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Jim Mattis, for example, at a hearing before the Senate Armed Service Committee, said, and I quote, there are many belts and many roads, and no one nation should put itself in a position of dictating one belt, one road. The French uh, president, uh, when he was in China in January 2018, said, these roads cannot be those of a new hegemony, which would transform those they cross into vassals. And more recently, in August 2018, the Malaysian Prime Minister said there should not be a situation where there is a new version of colonialism happening because poor countries are unable to compete with rich countries. So I just see several prominent voices starting to um, argue about the end game or the geopolitical um, aspects of Belt and Road. And around the same time, as BRI began to make progress in various countries and a series of projects came to light, the international criticism became more focused on BRI's dubious practices and its negative impact on recipient countries, especially their increased vulnerabilities due to unbearable um, levels of debt uh, owing to China. A professor of strategic studies in New Delhi described BRI as a way for the Chinese leadership to use economic tools to advance geostrategic interests. And to him, Beijing intends to ensnare uh, strategically located developing countries in a debt trap that leaves them vulnerable to Chinese influence. And I'm sure all of you have heard about this trope now, the debt trap diplomacy that China is wanting to um, uh, to use uh, within the Belt and Road Initiative. And in the same vein, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Tillerson described China's model of financing infrastructure project as predatory economics. Such concerns later illustrated, uh, were later in illustrated when, in December 2017, China acquired the Hambantota port operations for 99 years um, after Sri Lanka failed to repay the loans that it had funded for its construction. And uh, at the same time, there's also a report um, co-signed by uh, European ambassadors based in Beijing that condemned BRI for hampering trade, giving unfair advantages to Chinese companies, and attempting to shape globalization to suit China's own interests. So a growing US and EU pushback against uh, the geostrategic aims, the lack of compliance with good governance standards, and at the same time, an increasing number of countries, uh, recipient countries, who began to have second thoughts about uh, the terms of the deals that they signed with China and express willingness to go back to the negotiating table or even to cancel some of the deals uh, because of the unmanageable financial burdens they will impose. So we have the example of Nepal, who canceled two hydropower dam projects, Malaysia, who has announced the, their intention to renegotiate the contracts, Maldives, Myanmar, who also wanted to reconsider some of the projects, etc. So, the discussions also around this time started to happen about possible counter responses um, and especially focusing on alternative development, uh, infrastructure development funding. 
Uh, the U.S. has doubled um, the OPEC portfolio, passed the BUILD Act. Um, the U.S. also has started to work in cooperation with other regional powers, uh, Japan, India and Australia in particular, to promote joint development, um, uh, joint finance development projects in the Indo-Pacific region. The European Union um, has uh, launched a strategy for connecting Europe to uh, Asia in September 2018, and India and Japan have partnered to create the uh, Asia-Africa Growth Corridor in 2017. So this list that's not really exhaustive, but it's quite long already, uh, of pushback and emerging counter responses may give the impression uh, that BRI is now in a very difficult position. Uh, but I would argue that the situation is not static. Uh, first, all of the countries that either have cancelled their projects or asked uh, for renegotiations of the contract still continue to cooperate uh, with China under the Belt and Road framework, including one of the most critical of them, which was Malaysia. Um, and second, Beijing is not paralyzed. It's really tracking and assessing the progress of the initiative, including the recent hurdles. And the leadership has initiated a recalibration phase. And that's my third section. First of all, um, I want to, um, to say that the pushback didn't really come as a surprise for Beijing. Rather, it was sort of anticipated from the beginning. In the early months after the launch of uh, BRI, the Chinese uh, policy analysts started to examine what potential hurdles could come up along the way. And they defined them as follows. First, China's lack of experience and knowledge of the social political complexities in BRI countries. Second, the local insurgent or terrorist groups that could put security, the security of projects and uh, personnel at risk. Third, the economic viability and also the sustainability of the initiative. They discussed options to mitigate the risks. And fourth, the possible negative reactions, um, both from great powers who would consider Belt and Road as a threat to their own influence, and also from recipient countries who would be uneasy about China's own growing influence. So I would say they were pretty much on the mark, because this is what's happening, actually. But this assessment didn't really stop um, in the early phase. It's really an ongoing process in which all the actors involved in the development of Belton Road, the ministries, the provinces, the businesses, but also the experts from Chinese academia and think tanks are working to assess to study, to examine BRS progress and the challenges it faces, and to provide recommendations to the leadership. The Chinese bureaucracy is also organized to allow a smooth supervision and feedback circle. Um, in the military, we call this the UDA loop. It's the circle that observe, orient, decide, and act. It's a little bit what China is doing with Belt and Road, really. You have two central ad hoc task forces um, that were created in March 2015 um, to supervise all the Belt and Road related activities. Um, they're called leading small groups on advancing the construction of the Belt and Road. And the replica, there are many different replicas of these leading small groups um, in all the relevant Chinese ministries in each Chinese province. They meet on a regular basis. Um, they include representatives from a variety of relevant entities, uh, including government offices, uh, banks, and SOEs. So the information really circulates from top to bottom and bottom up. And if necessary, the central government gives new guidelines to orient the direction of the Belt and Road. And this is what happened in August 2018 when Xi Jinping chaired a symposium marking the fifth anniversary uh, of the Belt and Road. There's a long list of attendees uh, during this symposium. There are leaders of provinces, representatives from business companies, experts and scholars, as well as officials uh, from central, um, uh, central entities of the party. 
really in the face of the international pushback, the CCP is not paralyzed, but it's adapting. Um, it's an adaptation that Xi Jinping described with a, a very artistic uh, metaphor. He said, we need to evolve from Xie Yi to, Kong, to Gongbi, which is a Chinese art form of paint. The Xie Yi is kind of big brush strokes, very thick. And Gongbi is more detailed. So basically, we have for five years uh, started um, big general uh, endeavor. And now we need to be more specific and more careful about what we do and draw it in more details. So in response to the foreign claims of um, geostrategic intent, China is not really trying to change its intentions or its, really, its objectives, but it's trying to shape the foreign perceptions uh, in a more favorable way. Um, and I think that really trying to win hearts and minds have become one of the priorities that she has given during this August 2018 symposium. And we have had an illustration of that at the, uh, at the Belt and Road Forum in a couple of weeks ago. The message was really reassuring. We're not going to, uh, we're going to be careful about corruption. We're going to be careful about um, all the, the good elements of the Belt and Road. In that forum, in that symposium, <laughs> sorry, uh, she instructed to optimize the contents and methods of the propaganda campaign so that people from participating countries in Belt and Road uh, would uh, see that really the initiative helps them on a daily basis. He also uh, asked to win over public opinion uh, via the promotion of projects uh, that enhance the general population's sense of real gain. Um, he uh, insisted that people to people exchanges, especially in the field of education, uh, science and th technology, culture, tourism, also be more promoted to help downplay the strategic aspects of the initiative, and, you know, bring more of the soft power rather <coughs> than the hard construction. And finally, he also requested that more emphasis be placed on promoting the image of Belt and Road as a way to improve the global development model and governance, and as a, and here I quote, powerful measure against unilateralism, isolationism, and against trade protectionism. So these are all code words for what the Americans are doing. Um, the positive reinforcement of BRI is accompanied by Xi's uh, admonition to all the relevant Chinese entities to fulfill their responsibilities and take action to make it a success. So really, he asked the businesses and the state of companies um, who are operating in Belt and Road countries to become ambassadors of the BRI, make sure that their behavior and their practices uh, revolve on the project so that they're worthy of praise, not of criticism. And at home, at home, he said that there must be no bystanders. Um, the party uh, will strengthen its leadership, its oversight, um, and make sure that everything is supervised so that hopefully there will not be so many pitfalls. And finally, he requested that the initiative align more systematically with the needs of, of local countries. Um, so this is a process that's usually described as, as docking in Chinese, which is uh, consists in integrating Belt and Road Initiative with the participating country's own economic development strategies. So for example, in Kazakhstan, uh, docking it with the Nuri uh, or in other countries, docking again with local countries, um, um, local development uh, strategies. I think that um, the first years were focused on big infrastructure projects, um, but during that symposium, she said that um, they should also focus on, on smaller ones and focus on high quality infrastructure uh, efficiency, um, because again, uh, it would help uh, reinforce the local support for the Belt and Road, and each project ought to be uh, carefully crafted. So 
we can see that there's a beginning of a readjustment that's um, uh, really from from the center central government, and you can you can see how this is starting to translate into the reality again um, at the Belt and Road Forum. She said that there will be zero tolerance on corruption. He also, um, uh, there was also a joint statement that repeatedly called for high quality projects and standards. Um, and he also encouraged develop, uh, developed nations to um, invest in connectivity projects in developing countries. So uh, a China developed uh, countries working in third uh, countries. Um, and hoping that the cooperation will be open, green, and clean. So all of this is not to say um, that the Chinese leadership is necessarily going to succeed, um, but I think it would be a mistake to believe that Belt and Road would just fail on its, uh, of its own accord. And we'll have to see whether the promises that were given during the Belt and Road Farm are going to be sustained uh, in the long run, but I think this process of recalibration and adaptation is very important for us to see that Belton Road is not set in stone. It is really trying to adjust, um, but the direction is still the same. It's really about China's growing influence over the region. So I'm going to end with this, and I'd be happy to answer your questions if I can. Thank you very much for your attention. the action or reaction by the international U.S. companies doing business in China and also where do now India stands? So you mentioned something about this project because even locals, local, they are also against the project. And corruption played a big role during when this project was signed during the uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm not sure about the U.S. businesses. I, I have not really interacted with them. Actually, I'm going to um, um, participate in an event tomorrow with them. So maybe I'll learn more about how they, they see Belt and Road, whether they see it as a, an opportunity or, or, or not. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure about um, what their choice will be. You know, uh, U.S. businesses are private sector and they are mostly animated by the need of their shareholders and making money. Uh, so um, the thing is, looking at it from the other way around, there's not so much space for them actually to cooperate with China on the Belt and Road project. Um, there's been some studies about the, um, the different projects uh, taken under the Belt and Road banner and they're usually 85 to 90 percent of the contracts are actually realized by Chinese actors, Chinese businesses. So it gives you just a little bit of a uh, piece of the pie that for maybe for other companies. Um, as far as India is concerned, India has been, um, I think, one of the very few countries who has refused to endorse the Belt and Road, who has refused to participate in the forums that China has organized, um, that has refused to cooperate with China in Belt and Road projects. Um, this can be explained uh, by many different reasons, including the traditional India-China rivalry, but also the, the China-Pakistan economic corridors, uh, corridor goes through a disputed area um, between, between uh, India and China. So endorsing it would equal to say, um, we endorse your, your, your territorial claim. Oh, by the way, I'm Raghubir uh, Goel, I'm a journalist at the White House. Just quick follow-up. Uh, during this U.S. and Chinese talks, <coughs> are these issues coming up uh, when the Chinese premier comes to the White House? So, hmm, I don't know. I, I'm not. I'm not uh, admitted in the White House, so I couldn't answer that question. I think in the beginning of the launch of Belt and Road, um, there were discussions about including the the Americans into it, but. 
this administration has been extremely reluctant uh, to, to, again, to endorse it. And I think over the, over the last few months, it's really been clearer and clearer um, that the realm of cooperation is probably going to shrink instead of competition. And again, the U.S. has started to work on alternative uh, um, answers to Belt and Road, not cooperative. Thank you. Sir? Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, in terms of the human rights atrocities that China is affecting against the people of occupied East Turkestan, occupied Tibet, um, against uh, religious minorities like Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, um, to what extent have we been meeting uh, Belt and Road Initiative partner countries? I think they're 70, 71 now. Uh, to what extent have we seen them begin to uh, express concern about what China is doing in the human rights realm? Is it possible that uh, uh, as these situations continue to deteriorate and human rights uh, abuses uh, come more and more to light, uh, is it possible that this will pose a major impediment to uh, China's military and military policy? Uh, thank you for your question. I think now the number of, of uh, partner countries is up to 156, or 126, sorry, the last time um, I checked. But this is according to Beijing, so I'm not sure how exactly uh, the, they, they put the, the label on participating countries, whether it's just signing up from MOU or coming to the forum, you know, I think um, they're, they're expanding it a little bit uh, themselves. It, the question about human rights and how do this, these countries answer, um, I think this is one of the, the key areas where you're going to see how China exerts its economic leverage on countries to make sure that people don't um, counter its interests. And so in this case, I think uh, there are very few countries who have officially spoken up against what's going on in Xinjiang in particular, um, uh, except for Turkey. Um, and the when, when, for example, the Prime Minister of Pakistan was asked about it, he just denied that he had heard about it. And um, so it tells you how much leverage Beijing has thanks to these investments and thanks to this economic power it has. So, you know, here we're not talking about a military coercion, <coughs> we're talking about some sort of implicit economic coercion that force countries explicitly or implicitly to align with China's uh, or with Beijing's preferences. And so not coming up with uh, what's going on in Xinjiang is one of the consequences. And it's not just in, you know, it doesn't just apply in, in smaller or developing countries. It happens in Europe too, for example, uh, where um, Chinese investments in Greece or in Hungary have uh, have um, pushed somehow the local governments to ignore um, the, the human rights um, and refuse to sign joint communiques with other European countries, for example. So it has an impact on that too, sir. Um, you mentioned how Xi Jinping has been at least recently saying how it wants the URI to be more transparent, less corruption, more green. To what extent do you think that this includes <coughs> actual URI reforms? And to what extent could this just be a positive PR campaign but with no real reforms actually being done? Well, thank you. That's, that's a good question too. I think in everything that China is saying, we also need to match it up with what China is doing. So there's a lot of um, um, rhetoric that's very positive. Now we need to see how does that translate in reality. I personally doubt that China is going to change fundamentally its modus operandi because 
you know, its own economic model is not based on transparency. The way it works at home <coughs> is not based on transparency, opening bids. It's, it's just centralized as heavy state subsidies. And I think that the way China's um, entities or businesses act outside of their own borders reflects how they operate within their own borders. So let's wait and see, but transparent and open, um, I, I would not keep my hopes too high on this one. Sir? Hi, my name is Dr. Akhan Bank, I'm a full math scholar. I'm actually writing about uh, the geostrategic effects of central mobilization and how that will empower uh, China militarily and strategically to mm -hmm. contend with the US in the next kind of 30 years. So that's what I've been doing for the last six months and going crazy about it. But, but thank you for this, and a lot of this uh, I've already covered. But fundamentally, what I wanted to ask is that uh, in the long term, what we're really looking at here is uh, the changing global order. Mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, the rejection of the liberal world order and how China wants to shape the global order in its own time. Uh, and, and our norms and values here uh, conflict with that. And how are we going to contend with that uh, strategically in reality? Uh, as many strategies said earlier on, nip it in the bud before it really rises and before it can really challenge you and it's detrimental to you. So my question here is that you've got Italy, you've got France, even Britain now, unfortunately, uh, taking a lot of interest. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, Chancellor going to, to Beijing and Forum and uh, looking at interests as far as uh, future opportunities because we're going, to, going out of Europe, for example. So, how do we contend with that? Because that's a contradiction in our long-term strategic interest, do you not think? Thank you. It's a, it's a fantastic question. And I think it's very much what's at the core of this Belt and Road. It's about contending views of the world. Um, so there are many different layers to what you asked. I think the, the, the military side, we're also working with MBR on that, looking at you know, what's the next step in the securitization or the security aspects of the Belt and Road Initiative. We're going to have a, a volume edited in a few months about that. Um, it is absolutely about changing the global order. Um, I think that Beijing is not really sure yet about what exactly it would look like. It's an ongoing process. We'll also have a, another project on, on this Chinese perspective on the new Chinese-led order, basically. So we're going to be able to dig in more um, in, in this part of the thing. Um, that discrepancy between economic opportunities and strategic challenge is getting more and more uh, visible now because of China's rising aggressiveness um, and military expansion. You know, this used to be the case for 30 years that we pushed aside the strategic dimension of it just to look at the, the economic opportunities. You know, China was developing, it was a, and it still is, a massive market for our companies, uh, Europeans or for or Americans. And this is how and why we were so engaged also with, uh, with China. Now as, a, as it's growing, expanding, uh, more, I mean, stronger, more um, modernized militarily, and also now you can see also appearing this ideological component. Xi Jinping himself said in October 2013, uh, 2017 that China can now be an alternative model for countries who want to stay independent. So that tells you a lot about what they want to achieve. Um, so yeah, how are we going to um, to 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 reconcile these opportunities or economic opportunities that are shrinking too, maybe, um, with the strategic component of it. And I think that the US administration has come up with this idea of competition, great power competition. It is at the beginning of an answer to your question. It's not a fully formed one. There's still a lot to be done. Um, they're trying to wrestle with, with that one. I personally don't have the answer. If I would, I I think I would not be here today. <laughs> yes, Miss. Actually, yes. <coughs> um, 
So I mean the I've been working in the investment consultancy sector in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Central Asia. Um, mainly like coordinating this kind of high level investment project between China and Central Asian countries. Uh, but one thing is uh, getting very strange because on the one hand, the Open Road Initiative want to encourage the people to want to encourage Chinese investment go beyond, go um, uh, go abroad mm -hmm. to make the investment. But on the other hand, we also know now there are this kind of money transaction regulations, especially under the National Bank and under the um, um, uh, Foreign Exchange uh, Commission, getting more and more uh, tight. So, for example, for a general Chinese citizen, if they want to transit uh, over 10,000 USD dollar, there are many transactions that are gonna, gonna be under, under strict regulations. So imagine, so on the one hand, politically, you want your investment to go beyond, go broad, but on the other hand, you have very strict like financial control because it's in they said it is in the terms they are fighting this kind of corruption things, money laundering abroad. Uh, I would like to take the we I know in Kazakhstan we have two investment cases. All the agreement have been signed, all the setup is about to start just because their national bank they said no there's the money, it's just kind of we cannot allow to change it out. So our investment project just like failed, I mean. So this is already happening now in the regions. So I just want to, and in addition to that, now we have like a U.S. and the China uh, trade war going. So what's going to be the scenario under the background of they are doing this kind of inside corruption, fighting anti-corruption campaign and the trade war? But on the other hand, are they still going to encourage or increase the FDI in other countries? Because essentially, just the FDI is significantly now dropping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this this um, is consistent with the also overall Chinese FDIs have been slowly um, um, decreasing. Um, and this is also the result of, I think in the first few years of Belt and Road, because they wanted to create the momentum, they had to you know, put a lot of money or at least promises of investment and also of of loans in those projects. Now, because it's been going on in so many directions, it's also wasteful and they just don't want to be wasteful. So they're trying to regulate a little bit more. There's been some guidelines. For example, in the first, I think in the first few years of Belt and Road, they used some inve Chinese investors, one of, some of these companies that you're talking about who are you know, um, told to go abroad and, and to invest abroad have invested in, in in soccer clubs in Europe, for example, nothing to do with Belt and Road, um, or investing in you know, um, I don't know cultural companies, things that had nothing to do with infrastructure development either. So after a while, the central government started to see that this is wasteful of our resources, so they, they produced some guidelines that were more stringent about what, ex what exactly you can do. The, the, the thing with, with uh, Beijing is that they're always hesitating or they're, it's difficult for them to both go abroad or expand overseas and at the same time retain a level of central government control or party control over their activities. So that creates some contradictions yes. that they're trying to figure it out, uh, to figure out. And, Financial control is one of them because of the reasons you said, the fact that they don't want you know money to leave the country, that corruption money or or, or some of their population investing uh, abroad and and um, and draining uh, the, the the money out, out outside. Um, at the same time, there's also um, sometimes, although most of the the agreements are. Uh, opaque. We don't really know. It's not open and transparent. We don't have records of the different deals that are made at the at the government level. Um, but there's also a, a, sometimes some <coughs> currency swap agreements that can also help having those tran financial transactions on a bilateral basis as well. They're tiny amounts, but this could be something that's replicated in, in the future. So. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Hammer. I'm from the U.S. International Trade Commission. And thank you very much for your really interesting remarks. I'm very interested in what you have to say. Um, 
when we looked at uh, Chinese overseas foreign direct investment, uh, when we looked at the history of uh, before 2013 and after 2013, um, it's very similar by country and by composition in different sectors. So I guess at the end of the day, I'm wondering about how much of the BRI is really a label switching exercise, maybe a little bit of more coordination by the government, but what makes the BRI unique from investment that would have to support investment? Excellent question. Thank you very much. Um, I, you're, you're right. Sometimes it's not about an increase of trade, or you cannot really see in the figures that there's a really increase of trade of trade because you're a Belt and Road country, or an increase in investment. I think it's more, and how is it different? I think it's more again about creating this momentum. I mean, five years ago, nobody would be interested in infrastructure financing, probably, and China has created this momentum. Um, I think, again, when you, when you think about Belt and Road, maybe try not to be too much caught up on the, on the concrete side of things, but try to think about it again in terms of how China is using this as influence or leverage for achieving a political purpose. And if you see it this way, then you can, you can see that it has a lot of appeal for those countries. And if you also look at the different layers of Belt and Road and on the normative side and on shaping the standards, industrial standards, you know, all those, those attached um, components that are again intangible. Um, the people don't pay attention too much on the people-to-people -people exchanges. China has been investing a lot in local scholarships to develop uh, the, the education of the future elites of these countries. So think of it as, as a very comprehensive program, again, to reinforce China's influence in its broader neighborhood. Um, so you can argue that it's just a label, and actually some of the, some of the projects have started before 2013, you know, the Hambantota port and Guadar, and there are many projects that existed or were on the way before BRI was launched. But here it's a sort of catalyzes the efforts of the government, of the enterprises, of uh, the national resources, gives them direction, again, to achieve a political purpose. Hi, um, I just first want to say thank you for your remark. Uh, I'm an international student studying at uh, uh, George Washington University. So I'm from China, so thank you so much um, for this relatively non-biased remark. Um, being, you know, it's very refreshing, so I want to say thank you. Um, and second, I just want to say, just, you know, because you mentioned about the cooperation from Europe, especially like UK, uh, Italy, Greece, and also other financial assistance, um, just in terms of um, Turkey, the country as a sort of geopolitics and also sort of the midway uh, connection between Asia and Europe. What are the chances you think that will give um, the EU to sort of, you know, asking or inviting Turkey to join the EU? Because it's been a talk in the past few years, but there's like, you know, back and forth and there's a Division within Turkey, and um, yeah, I just want to very low. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you so much. that's the short answer. <laughs> Thanks for your question. Yes. Uh, hi, I would like to uh, thank you so much for your remarks, it's very interesting. Um, just a quick question about your uh, article that you wrote recently is it a May 3rd article? I, the, the one that this is based on, yes, um, I think it was. I'm not sure when it was published exactly, but very recently, yes. Very recently. yes. You're, you're the last article of yours on the website of Andy. Andy, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the question is about uh, how you assess uh, the effectiveness of the uh, um, initiatives that America and Europe uh, and Japan and India take as a reaction to the Belt and Road Initiative initiative like the BUILD Act or the European Union strategy and this Japan and India um, 
for Asia, Africa, Korea, mm -hmm. how do you assess? Are they really effective or is it's, it's just rhetoric? So I think here we're, we're looking at different scope and scale really and, and again I think the, the Belt and Road is really global now on its scope. Um, the, the different other responses are more uh, regional ones, so the European really looks at the European <coughs> side and connecting Europe to Asia. Um, kind of building of other of previous projects that the European Union has put into place at the Carrick and Trasica. These were um, things that were starting to emerge in the 1990s. Um, then the Africa, I mean the the, the India Japan corridor has. It's difficult to to see it emerging. I think there's there is some rhetoric. In uh, India is the, the probably less engaged partner of the two. Japan is doing a lot in infrastructure investment in both Southeast and Central Asia. As you know, it's a very very big big, big partner for those regions and has been for a long time. So it's building on this uh, long experience. Um, things that we have seen in, in the South Pacific are more maybe point by point and not really uh, fully organized and uh, you know in terms of, of financial power I think we're not looking at the same things at all. Um, the numbers are really small in comparison to what China has announced. Again, need to differentiate between what China says and what China does, how much money goes in the countries, this is very difficult to know in reality. Um, and, and, and also, these counter responses, again, are focused mostly on <coughs> infrastructure development financing. They don't really take into account all the other aspects of Belt and Road, including, you know, um, education, uh, commerce, trade, FDAs, etc, etc. So there's there's still a lot to be done to have a proper response, I think, more pre comprehensive one, sir. Yes, uh, the, uh, so the Western world uh, has approached Belt Road with, with the healthy amount of skepticism, um, and uh, you know, both about whether or not China's true intentions are uh, you know, uh, benevolent or whether or not they're nefarious. Um, Setting those that, that skepticism aside for a second, and looking at kind of what we've seen, if, assuming China is one of their fundamental tenets with the PRI is, is to really um, create a China-centric world order. Um, as an objective observer of PRI, um, how are we supposed to, or how is one supposed to uh, interpret uh, debt, debt trap diplomacy, uh, the economic uh, coercion that you're mentioning, um, you know, the, the other Kind of the negative consequences on local economies, etc. Uh, I mean, as an objective observer, if China saw this at the forefront as one of the possible kind of um, uh, critiques of Belt Road, why didn't they do a better job? Yeah, I, I think it's. Thank you for your question. Um, I think it's because you're positioning yourself here in DC, looking at the world with your own framework. And if you're trying to put yourself in the shoes of a Chinese policymaker uh, in the CCP, your options would be probably reduced. Um, again, because you, what is it that you have to offer to the world if you want to, you know, entice people to join in that new vision for the world? What is it that you have to offer? Um, Probably not ideology, because you don't want to sell, you know, um, socialism with Chinese characteristics to the other. Well, it's a different, it's a difficult sell. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's difficult. Um, you're not going to invade countries, because this is not what you do. You don't have the capacity to do that either. So, um, your, really your asset is that economic power that you have. It's the, the capital that you have. And how do you use that as an enticement, but also as a tool for coercion? That's, that's I think, what they're trying to do. Um, and again, testing a little bit. Um, 
about what can be done um, with the constraint that they that their own model has. So again, if you if you want to to build something that's appealing, you can say, hey, there's a lot of money to be made, and we're going to provide for your economic development for your for your your uh, infrastructure building. There's a lot of a, of appeal to that proposal, and and then uh, on the on the appeal side, it's also we can give you this money without imposing political conditions like other um, institutional lenders do. Uh, when Western <coughs> lenders go, they usually have a set of strings, as we say, um, that include transparency, good governance principles, uh, anti-corruption practices, <coughs> uh, civil society enforcement, etc., etc., etc. And China doesn't have that set of, of standards attached to their IMC. I guess, so that was kind of my question, is how does that reflect on the China-centric world order? Right? If that's, if that's what's developing from the BRI. Yeah, the so it, world, world, right? uh, yes, so it's a different model because it doesn't attach the political values that come with the liberal democratic order. So it's antithetic to a liberal democratic order. So you mentioned earlier about the, um, uh, at the forum, they were going to optimize, they want to double down, it sounds like, on optimizing the Hearts and Minds initiative. And you mentioned specifically education and science and technology. So in the last few years, there's been this controversy, particularly in the US, or certainly in Australia and New Zealand, with the proliferation of Confucius Institutes. Uh, that uh, the FBI director recently has said present a threat, and particularly in the areas of science and technology, which they're looking at this to gain access and to some of uh, many things that, that they've allegedly are already taken from state secrets, et cetera, et cetera, but doing it through the education uh, portal. So how do you think, if China is sitting back calibrating how they're going to optimize this hearts and mind campaign, and a lot of people would say that this Confucius Institute is part of that. How do you reckon that they would reconcile this? Several colleges, like for example, University of Chicago, have already said no Confucius Institutes here. And it's a controversy at several universities. So how do you think they're going to respond to this? So I think here the, the thing is that there's a difference between um, the Western well and the developing world. And I think the primary target of Belt and Road is the developing world. So there, the, I think the, the use of um, Confucius Institutes or, or economic, or sorry, educational exchanges for other purposes, um, it's probably not what they're trying to do in uh, Zambia or Morocco or um, there's a, I think the cultural element to the Confucius mm -hmm. Institute is probably higher in the developing world than it is uh, in the U.S., for example. So it's it's not a cookie cutter. You really need to look at what exactly is the local situation, um, and um, I'm not really comfortable about talking about Confucius Institutes because. I think there too there might be some generalizations that are probably counterproductive in the end and it just gives a distraction um, um, and, and kind of blurs um, a lot of things that China is doing in that domain uh, that are not properly assessed I think so yeah Thank you. yeah yes sir um, I am uh uh, Rumsfeld Fellow, and uh, uh, for the last six weeks, uh, PRI has been one of the key topics of our discussion. And most of uh, most of the things that you mentioned today really, you know, uh, very much support uh, most of the arguments that we had. Uh, however, I came to think about it, and I uh, can't but realize that this <laughs> rhetoric of caution primarily comes. From uh, Western countries, mm -hmm. the United States specifically. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Eastern side of the world, specifically the participating countries, mm -hmm. it all looks very pink and flowery. 
For example, uh, at the end of April, there was a big forum where all the Central Asian and uh, Southern, uh, South European country leaders gathered. And, you know, you read the news, you talk to uh, the officials, uh, the delegates, they're really looking forward to this cooperation. So, so what is it really? Is it uh, that these uh, participating countries do not really understand the full capacity of the threat they're under, or is it more about concern of Western countries about China expanding its influence in the world and changing the global order? Thank you, an excellent comment and an excellent question again. Um, I think it took a while for the US to, sorry, for the US government to fully apprehend um, what Belt and Road is all about. And even today, I think some of the things I've said here would still be contentious. Um, people maybe don't um, agree that there's a geopolitical intent that's much bigger um, than just building um, railways. Um, so I think for each country, the recipient countries really see their own interests first. And as you said, many of those countries act actually need infrastructure investment because they cannot get it from other uh, lenders. And and China and again, what China has to offer without the attached political strings can also be very appealing. Um, so I think we shouldn't be complacent about how appealing <coughs> this project is for recipient countries. I don't think that the U.S. government sees it just as a, as a, I don't know, as a token for, or as a, I don't know how to say it in English, um, as, as a primary focus on the, of the competition with China. I think it's more broad than this. Um, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a combination of a lot of aspects, you know. For the U.S., um, the competition with China again not, doesn't just come with what China is doing with Belt and Road. It's also about um, continuing to have a forward pre military presence in East Asia and and continuing to have access in the region, um, continuing to have the markets open, so there are many different dimensions to, to the competition or to what China is doing differently that now is starting to pose problems to the US. So then, as you said, each country, um, maybe they don't, they don't see that threat and I wouldn't blame them because maybe most of us don't see it either in those, in those terms. So it will take a while and sometimes it's different, difficult also to you know, to, to think about it because it's ongoing. And so many of the things that I've described could happen, or this is what China would like to see happen. But there's a lot of things that can happen in the meantime that are still, you know, each country has their own agency. They can, they can decide for themselves. It's not like Beijing wants and then Beijing gets. It's, it's more, much more complicated than that. So we'll have to continue to see it, but I think the, the, the advice I would have is for each country to see their own interest and have no complacency about, about it. And that includes the U.S. as well. I'm going to invoke the, the limited power I have here. And one more question. And I'm going to, I don't know, the young lady here has been very, she has the ministry of sitting next to me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is about the risk that Beijing assessed when they were going to put these projects in. One would assume that they realize that some of these infrastructure projects would not be able to be paid back based on just the multitude of the countries and you know the countries themselves involved. When we talk about uh, political influence going forward and then having you know, for instance, the 99-year lease, uh, what do you feel like from a percentage they expect that to come back from owned entities now that they will have for a long-term period, and what do you anticipate? your viewpoint on, similar to the U.S. in World War II, having our bases throughout Europe, then having, you know, long-term leases. Oh, thank you very much. I think this is, this is also where, when applying our, our regular framework, is tricky because 
we always tend to assess efficiency in terms of financial returns. I think part of the things that we see with BRI is also some sort of, uh, I don't know, some insurance premium. Um, and that Beijing is willing to waste some money if the strategic goal is important. So securing its energy imports, for example, or having access to certain resources or to uh, to certain routes, etc. So it might not make sense financially. You don't. Have, you're not going to have a lot of financial return on it. But then the impact for your security might be bigger. So that's the short answer to your question. Thank you, all of you, for being here today.